Hearts are in listen-only mode. Good morning and afternoon, everyone. I am Brad Adams. I am the website chair for Tennessee HFMA. And I am going to be uh, your host today for, for our webinar. Uh, this is part of our Tennessee Trains on Tuesdays series and also part of our HFMA Region 5 webinar series um, that we're doing in conjunction with, with all the other Region 5 chapters, which are Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get going today. Um, if you want to get the slide deck, you can get that off the Tennessee HFMA website, and you should see a link to that either in your confirmation email um, or in the chat box below. If you've got questions um, throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit them to the questions box. Um, I'll be monitoring those and you know, try, trying to find good spots to interject um, and, and ask those to our presenter today. Um, a couple other things we've got going on in the next month or so um, here in the Tennessee chapter. Um, we've got the Tennessee Society of CPAs annual health care conference coming up. Um, on December 2nd and 3rd, um, and HFMA members receive the Tennessee Society of CPAs member discount. There's more information about that on our website, along with um, December 10th is going to be a busy day. We have got uh, our next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, December 10th, and so we'll probably have information about that posting up on the website in the next week or so. And also, if you're in Middle Tennessee on that day, um, Tennessee HFMA and Tennessee Hymns are going to be having their holiday party at the Hutton Hotel. And so watch the website and your email. We'll have more information coming out about that as well. Uh, a couple other big institutes coming up. We've got the Tri-State Winter Institute on January 22nd through 24th, and that's down in Tunica, Mississippi. Um, so you can go to tristateinstitute.org for more information on that. And the Alabama chapter is going to be hosting the Region 5 Dixie Institute uh, February 25th through the 28th. And that's going to be down in Mobile, and I believe that timing lines up with Mardi Gras. So if you're thinking about going to that, uh, you might want to go visit the Alabama website and get your reservations made for the hotel there. I know that's always a pretty popular institute, especially when they manage to line it up with Mardi Gras down there. Um, so today um, we have got Gwen Missner. She is the VP of, for operations with Chamberlain Edmonds, which is you know part of MDN, and she's been with them for just around 10 years now. Um, during that time, she's spent ex she's worked extensively to help expand their practice, adding um, you know 15 new states, and she spent a lot of time working with various state Medicaid offices. Um, interesting thing about Gwen. Um, she started off as a nurse, same as um, our own Buffy Loveday, who is our webinar coordinator who takes care of getting all of our wonderful speakers uh, like Gwen for us to do these. Um, and so Gwen's going to talk about ACA eligibility for us today, and I will hand it over to her. Well, thank you. I appreciate that uh, very kind introduction. And welcome, everyone. I do think we have some questions that will pop up on your screen throughout the presentation just to um, keep things spiced up and appreciate Brad for coordinating all of this today. Um, our goal is really to introduce um, who CEA is, if you don't know, but largely our goal is to present um, an overview of the Affordable Care Act and some items that we think uh, would be very important to hospitals as we begin this rollout. Highlight some changes. <clears throat> and then discuss considerations and potential risks we think you ought to be taking into consideration over the next few months here. So just in quick uh, reference for CEA, you can see um, who we are. We are part of MD On. We're the service arm of MD On, and you can see some of the hospitals with whom we have relationships. We work with all size hospitals, but um, definitely our sweet spot is large academic medical centers, safety net hospitals, and um, not-for-profit organizations. So I want to talk a little bit now about the Affordable Care Act, and um, I want to make sure we cover these pieces, uh, but I also want to make sure that we don't bore people who already may have a good understanding of some of this information. So if I'm going too slowly or too quickly, would you please let Brad know 
so that um, I can um, either I can adjust my timing a bit. Most of you should be aware of these six categories: Medicaid expansion. That it is a state choice. You're probably aware also of the marketplaces slash exchanges. I believe now really the um, correct term is leaning towards marketplace. You probably are aware of a streamlined process and kind of who's who, who's able to do what within um, the organizations. And then a little bit we're going to talk about presumptive eligibility as it relates to Medicaid. So I'm hoping to give you those kind of policy overviews and a little and more detail uh, behind all of those for you. So clearly, I think it's been expressed um, that the expansion of Medicaid, um, according to the Supreme Court, is a state choice. And for those of you that are in Tennessee, and for those of you who may be watching from Georgia, we know that our two states have not have they've chosen not to participate in the Medicaid expansion. I do think it's important for all of us to know, though, that this is a decision that could change. I believe a number of hospitals in, in various states are putting up pressure on the legislative branch and the executive branch of their state governments because while the state may choose not to expand Medicaid, the decision about DISH, um, disproportionate share, and its diminishing value to hospitals is not a state decision. And that's a decision that will be having an impact on hospitals beginning in 2014. So even if the state opts not to expand Medicaid, they are still going to be impacted by the DISH cut. I also think um, it's important, I think it's interesting, but I think it's also important to understand the Arkansas model and why is that important. Part of that is important, I believe, because Tennessee is considering expanding Medicaid following the Arkansas model. And for that, if you're not aware of the Arkansas model, I think it, it would be helpful if you did have an understanding and um, could um, explain that, understand it enough to know what impact that would be on your hospital should Tennessee flip and, and decide to go the Arkansas model. I will also note that the governor of Georgia was quoted on an interview with BBC as saying if he were going to expand Medicaid, and he certainly wasn't saying he would, but he did say if he chose to do that, it would be by using the Arkansas model. So people say, well, what, what is the Arkansas model? Fair question. Um, it's really saying to CMS and Health and Human Services, we want the federal money. We want the funding. And we will use that funding to provide medical services for the expansion group as defined in the Affordable Care Act. Now, the expansion group are basically childless adults over 26 that from 26 to 64 who um, are from zero percent federal poverty level to 138 percent federal poverty level, and it would be allowing those individuals to get on Medicaid without first proving that they have a disability. And in both Tennessee and Georgia, that requires really that the person go through the Social Security process to be deemed medically disabled. So this would be a significant change in our states in this area if we were to follow the Arkansas model. The big difference between the Arkansas model and just expanding Medicaid is Arkansas is expanding, expanding services to this population through an insurance plan. So there will not be a lot of um, additional hiring by the Department of Medicaid in Arkansas. Um, there won't be case management models. There won't be utilization review. Any of those services in the Medicaid world, it will all happen in the insurance world. And it will really happen as a product that's going to be offered on the marketplace. 
It's just that that particular market or that particular product will cover a different group of people. Um, if you think of what does the insurance products or the qualified health plans, what market do they cover today on the marketplace? It really begins with individuals that are at 139 percent of federal poverty level. So this particular insurance plan would be only for those people who in other states likely would qualify for the Medicaid expansion. And some people have said to me, well, that's really just semantics. You know, that's, um, you know, a conservative governor saving face in a, you know, in a conservative state. And I, I believe to some extent that that would be reasonably accurate, although there are significant programmatic differences that, um, that, that go well beyond just um, language. This really is going to offer this population an insurance card. It's not going to say Medicaid anywhere on it, and it will be a product that should they get a job and, you know, they would have churned off uh, traditional Medicaid, they would be able to stay in the insurance realm because they could then um, buy uh, an insurance product if they were now at 300% federal poverty level, they could still stay in the marketplace. And instead of turning off Medicaid, turning on to an insurance plan, they would just move from one insurance plan to the other. So at this point, Brad, I don't see any questions. So I'm going to keep going. And um, I know that you will interrupt me um, if you do have uh, questions. Um, I think the key difference clearly an opt-in versus opt-out is that expansion population and that group of people that Chamberlain Edmonds has done a lot of work with in the past, so we know quite well. It's those childless adults who do not have insurance largely because they're unable to work. And so then you have to really determine why are they unable to work. And today in an opt-out state, you would, will still have to prove that they have a disability. Um, whereas in the new world, and I'm going to show you a map now so that you can see, well, where do all those states lie and, um, you know, what are the commonalities, if you will. Um, we have states clearly marked as those that are opting in and those that are opting out as well as where there's debate. And you can see clearly Tennessee, we have that there's debate ongoing about what the future is going to be. I would recommend if, you know, if you're a hospital in Tennessee, stay tuned because I think hospitals can declare them, or not hospitals, but states can declare themselves at any time. It does require both the legislature and the governor to be on the same page, however. And they could decide to opt in at a later date. Uh, it's not like a, uh, you know, a, a state could opt in this month, being November, and really be ready to launch and go live in January. I can give you an example. Michigan opted in fairly recently, within the past month. And they opted in in a fairly unique way. Uh, Michigan opted in because there was a committee. The governor was able to utilize the committee as opposed to the legislature to approve opting in based on the financial spend, meaning there really wasn't going to be much of a financial spend for Michigan. So we colored Michigan as opting in. There still is, frankly, a little bit of debate going on in Michigan, a little bit of pushback from the legislature that's saying, well, the governor just sort of found this obscure committee, and we're not sure it was the right thing to do. So I think there will always be, I mean, this is a very hot topic, and we're on health care. We're watching it very closely to see what will be happening. But if Tennessee were to, to decide to opt in, I think it would probably still take several months before you really got all the paperwork lined up and crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's with Health and Human Services for a go-live date. Uh, for instance, Michigan uh, made their stand about a month ago, and their um, projected go-live date is April 1, 2014. 
So they'll miss a few months of the Medicaid expansion, but anticipate clearly they will um, still be going live soon. Okay. Um, so I'm really finished at this point talking about Medicaid opting in, opting out. Um, so I'm going to move on to talk a little bit more about the insurance products. So if any of you did have questions um, that you might want to ask at this time, um, I you know would welcome that you ask those um, if you have questions specifically about Medicaid. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that you're pretty knowledgeable about Medicaid and I can move on to insurances. Brad, do we have any questions that have come in or anything? Uh, no, I have not seen any questions come in. Okay. Then I'm moving right along to the insurance exchanges, and this is what clearly in our geography has been <clears throat> um, a problematic implementation, to say the least, of the exchange slash marketplaces that CMS is organizing and running. <clears throat> Most of you, I would imagine, if you're following the news at all, you've clearly seen um, the, the screenshots of the exchange saying, we're very busy right now, please check back. And you've probably been following a fair amount of the difficulty and the problems with the exchanges. The latest information on the um, CMS marketplace is there still is a plan for those marketplaces to be functioning fully by the end of November. I think we all need to see what happens come the end of November and see if that really, uh, really works. And there is still debate and discussion about whether the penalty for people being able to apply for the insurance, whether that will be extended. Right now, the penalty um, does not go into effect until April of 2014, so it has received one extension. But there is still much debate about whether it should receive an additional extension beyond that. So why would somebody go to an insurance exchange? Well, we're, I'm going to show you in a few minutes a, another map. You're going to understand that I love maps and colors and like to color code states. But I'm going to show you not every state the exchange is managed by CMS. Many states decided to manage their own exchanges and to have control of those from the beginning. And frankly, those state-run exchanges do seem to be running a little bit more smoothly than the federally facilitated exchanges. So you can see down here I have three types of exchanges, state-based exchange, and I'll show you in a few minutes what states have their own exchange. <clears throat> federally facilitated exchanges, and then those that are a partnership. And a lot of people ask, well, what does a partnership mean? And that means, for instance, the example that I have there is Illinois. There are others as well. But what that means, as an example, is that Illinois said to, the, to CMS, we really don't believe we have the resources to get this up and running um, and be ready by October 1. So we'll default and let CMS run the exchange. But at some point, and I believe the time point for Illinois really is about two years away, where they would like to take over ownership of the exchange and have it become a state-based exchange. So the exchange, the go-live date was supposed to be October 1 for, this, for all exchanges. <laughs> we all know that people are having a lot of difficulty getting on the CMS exchange. Um, and if someone had enrolled between October 1 and the middle of December, they would have had coverage beginning January 1, 2014. That's why CMS is pushing so hard for this end of November having the exchange really fully functional so individuals still have an opportunity in that two-week period by, from the end of November to the middle of December so that their coverage can be effective in January. So I do believe um, you know, CMS anticipated there might be some difficulties. So there always was this built-in bonus enrollment period. 
and that people would have from the 1st of January through the end of March in 2014 to also um, enroll. And what that means, if somebody signs up for insurance say in February of 2014, their coverage would likely be effective in March 1 of 2014. However, the way it stands today, there's been no change to this enrollment period. So <clears throat> it's very important, I think, for hospitals to understand that if someone comes to your facility with an episode of care in April of 2014, and they, my favorite term is coulda, shoulda, woulda, if they could have qualified, they would have qualified for insurance, and they should have um, signed up for insurance, but they did not, there is nothing for that individual until the next open enrollment period, which the annual enrollment for the insurance exchanges is going to mirror the Medicare open enrollment period, which is October 1 through the middle of December. <clears throat> so that patient that's admitted in April will truly be self-pay for you and will be self-pay through the end of 2014. The other important thing that I think is very, um, really very pertinent for hospitals is that unlike Medicaid, of course in, in Tennessee you don't really have much retro anyway with Medicaid, but unlike Medicaid in some states, and for instance in Georgia, we have a three-month retroactive period where if I were to apply for Medicaid now, this is you know the middle of November, so if I were to apply for Medicaid today, I would have three months prior to the beginning of November if my patient had any medical bills that would be covered when that Medicaid gets approved. Insurance is not ever going to have retroactivity. It's only going to be effective the beginning of the month after enrollment. And that's if you get the patient signed up by the middle of the month. If you get the patient signed up at the end of the month, <clears throat> say the end of November, this time of year next year, if you got them signed up, well, sorry, that's a bad example. I'm sorry. Let me use the example. If somebody signed up the middle of February 2014, say February 20th, they would not have insurance March 1 because you have to allow the insurance company time to onboard the individual, to get the card out to them, et cetera, et cetera. And so they would likely, with a February 20 um, application, they would have insurance beginning April 1. So I, that is very important, I think, for, insurance, for hospitals to understand because then we have advised some of our customers to really think about more proactive outreach services to get people enrolled. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So here's my, uh, my next state map. <clears throat> and so you can see clearly Tennessee um, and, and Georgia, most of the southeastern states, opted to, to let CMS run their exchange. But just to the north of Tennessee is Kentucky. And Kentucky, believe it or not, is one of the poster children, if you will, for a good exchange. They have already signed up well over 50,000 people, and their exchange is called Connect, K-Y-N-E-C-T, is working quite well and um, is really a leader for the other state exchanges. You can look at other exchanges. Um, the Colorado Exchange seems to be working fairly well. California is having a little bit of issue um, and I believe they haven't really released it to the consumer yet. Oregon as well has not been released to the consumer. And Washington has some bugs, but they do have consumers using it and are signing people up. But I do think it's, it's just very interesting to me that Kentucky's um, done a couple of things very different from, from its southern um, states, uh, meaning Georgia and Tennessee, and that's it, that they opted into Medicaid and they decided to run their own exchange and really are leading the path, if you will, for how well exchanges are working. So 
you've probably heard these three terms, navigators, in-person assisters, and certified application counselors. Um, what these terms mean, really, is that a navigator or an in-person assister and a certified application counselor all can essentially do the same thing um, by in their ability to help a patient that's in a hospital or in a clinic. And that means they could interview the patient, they could talk with them, they could help them with their Medicaid application as well as their insurance application. The difference is navigators and in-person assisters are grant-funded. The navigators are grant-funded by CMS, and the in-person assisters are grant-funded by a state grant. And that would be, if I go back to my map, Kentucky has in-person assisters because they're using their grant funds, calling them something different than navigators, but they're very similar in scope of work. The additional activities for navigators and in-person assisters is that they must work with the general consumer who calls them and wants to enroll, and they must do some sort of outreach activity to the community to get people enrolled. Certified application counselors are not required to do that. They're not going to be paid to do that. Um, it's up to them if there's an organization out there that wants to, they certainly can do it. They're not prohibited from it, but they're not required. So I hope that um, helps clear up what these terms really mean. All individuals in any of these categories have to disclose a potential conflict of an in interest. And what that conflict of interest would be is if I have somebody in my family who is also um, employed by a quality health plan, I mean a qualified health plan, I would need to disclose that. All of these individuals have to act in the best interest of the applicant, which means that in our contract, which um, Chamberlain Evans has a contract as a certified designated organization with CMS, we are not permitted to steer an individual to a certain qualified health plan. We, might, we can educate people. We can talk to them about, you know, for instance, if Vanderbilt had, was in this network and not in this network, it's perfectly acceptable to be able to say to the patient, you are here at Vanderbilt. You obviously chose this organization. If you want to stay with your doctors and your hospital in Vanderbilt, here are the health plans that are in that Vanderbilt's in their network. What I can't do as a certified application counselor is say, oh, I know the Vanderbilt plan. That's the only plan I recommend. This is the one you really need to sign up with. I hope you, you all can see the difference between those two types of conversations with patients. So the other thing that's happening while all this people are making decisions about Medicaid, the exchanges are getting set up or not set up, and we continue to work on those. What also happened was web portals were developed. In some states, there's web portals for Medicaid and web portal for the insurance exchange. The concept is there is no wrong door. So in theory, if a patient shows up at the insurance exchange and they really want Medicaid, their information should get transmitted over to the Medicaid web portal uh, and to the Medicaid office. That's not working well in all states yet. Um, and first of all, you know, in Tennessee, we've got to, we've just got to get the CMS web portal working um, to then further test if somebody ended up coming into the CMS exchange and meaning to sign up for Medicaid that, that data would transmit. The application does have to be simplified, and they do have to accept it in paper, online, or in person. And so a number of organizations, us included, are doing paper applications for patients that want insurance. And the reason that we're doing that is because it has been very difficult for our staff to actually um, get online during the hours that we generally see patients and sign them up. 
the, um, I'll talk a little bit more uh, later about the electronic validation of income and citizenship. And then if a state expanded Medicaid, then there was no asset test for that Medicaid program. But if, as we sit today, uh, states have not expanded Medicaid, there still are MAGI Medicaid programs. And those programs are the children's program, pregnant women, and also if you have a low-income Medicaid that does not have a disability component, those um, programs will be determined by MAGI only. Those new rules have to go into effect by January. And that really means that you'll be using the federal data matching and the calculation for income will follow the MAGI rules. So I think just I would reiterate, it's really important to remember on this insurance and using the web portals that you do have to enroll during open enrollment and that there's no retroactivity. So how does the application work? Well. Hey, hey, Gwen. Yeah. Hey, um, we've got one question uh, that's come in here, okay. and now might be a good place to um, answer that. And also, I didn't know if you wanted to go ahead and do any of your polling questions yet. Sure, I'm happy to do a polling question. Uh -huh. And while you're doing that, uh, doing a polling question, how about if I answer the question that's come up? Uh, all right. You want to do the very first one? First polling question? Um, oh, wait a minute. I. It's uh, it's about taking uh, applications at the bedside. You know what? I'm not seeing that one, and I must just I'm I'm seeing the um, Medicare question, Brad. I'm just I'm not seeing the other one. Would you mind just reading me the first question about bedside? Yeah, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and put that up there. Okay. Um, so okay. we're asking, um, do you plan to take applications live at the patient's bedside? You know, great question. I appreciate someone who did this, and and I, I don't I, I say that um, to say that we absolutely are um, planning to take applications bedside, and this is a perfect time for that question because this slide speaks to why we would take that um, bedside. We have equipped our staff. We're still in the process of rolling it out, and since a lot of the web portals aren't functioning, we're, um, we're taking our time to make sure that we deploy our tablets well. But we're deploying tablets to, we call them healthcare representatives, that go up to the patient's bedside. We're equipping them um, with absolute security and then also 4G wireless so that they can connect to the web portal for the insurance exchange. And the reason that we're doing that is because we want to send, as you're on the Exchange website, if you look at that real time and you look at the Federal Data Hub portion, what will happen is you'll put in the demographic information for the patient and that data goes out to Social Security Administration and Homeland Security. And we would get a message back literally as part of the interview that would say, please proceed with the application. Um, patient is a citizen or a legal permanent resident. Or we could get a message back that would say, um, please cease um, this application as patient is not eligible to be applying for insurance on the exchange. And what that really means is the person is here undocumented and undocumented um, individuals cannot purchase insurance on the exchange. Then as you go further in the interview, and you're putting in the household size and um, the, you know building the household. Then you'd get information back validating last year's tax return from the IRS. And so you'd get a message that would say, "Okay, Jose says he made fourteen thousand dollars." Or you know, I'm sorry. What it would say is Jose's tax return last year was $14,000. Now that's what I've seen the prototype show today. We also have been told that we might get something that we enter in what the patient says their current income is and the validation may come back. That's within 10% of their tax return last year. 
please proceed, no additional documentation needed. So this is what it, the intended approach is, all right? I have to tell you, we've really not been able to test this yet. So um, I'm showing you what we've built and what we intend to do and that we absolutely intend to do it uh, by the bedside. And I can give you an example of Oregon. What Oregon does is you begin the interview with the person, um, and we have our secure log on to the Oregon uh, Medicaid and insurance web portal. We begin an interview, and then it says and sends an email to us, the certified application counselor. You have five minutes to authenticate that email to really keep the patient's information secure, and then you can proceed with the interview to help them. So we believe real-time um, eligibility is going to be critical, and being able to connect from wherever the patient is to the internet is also going to be critical. I hope that answers that question. Well, I think so, and this was this was one of our polling questions as well. Um, so, so we can see here the results are up on the screen. That uh, you know, we've got forty-three percent of people that their organizations are going to be doing this for sure, and another forty-seven percent who are going to to default to whatever their vendor chooses to do that's already helping them out with their their registrations. So, this seems like it's going to be a pretty popular uh, option among among hospitals, as I expected it. Um, to be, and so we've got a, a, a related question here that's coming through the chat. Um, Michael asks, um, even if paper or phone application, does not all the information need to be entered into the web portal anyway? So if, if you're doing a manual or someone's calling in to apply. Yes, the information does all have to be entered into the web portal, which is frankly one of the concerns about so many paper applications today that, um, you know, I, I believe this, this individual, Michael, has probably been watching the news a bit and has seen that um, consumers were directed to just fill out paper applications. Those paper applications still have to get entered into the web portal. And the concern today, of course, is if the web portal is um, faulty, then whoever is entering them is still going to have the same difficulty. Um, what we're doing to shore that up is, and we always do this, this is um, really standard practice for us, we're scanning in and keeping a copy of the application because um, most of you who've worked with, I mean, maybe we have state agencies on the phone, I don't know, but it's not uncommon for state or federal agencies to lose whatever you've sent them. So we always keep copies of anything we sent in, and I believe that would at least help shore up um, the, you know, the process if you are doing paper apps today. I hope that answered that question. I think so. Oh, let's see here. All right, there we go. We're back to your PowerPoints now. Okay. I do have one other question that has come up about Medicare. Um, none of the Affordable Care Act applies to Medicare. So if an individual has Medicare as their primary and they have a, a secondary insurance or a supplemental insurance, I've had people ask me, can they buy the supplemental policy on the exchange? The answer to that is no. Um, there are no changes anticipated to Medicare because of the Affordable Care Act, nor will any of that be addressed by um, the, the web portals. So moving ahead, tax premiums. And um, this might be good time, um, Brad, I think there is a question there about, if I re recall right, that about hospitals maybe uh, wanting to pay premiums for patients. Let me see. Yes, we have that question. Let me bring it up here. So uh, okay. we'll, we'll put this up for about a minute, give everybody a chance to uh, respond. So asking, has your hospital considered premium assistance for your patients? Right. Um, so then I'll just keep, while, Brad, while we're um, waiting for the, the answers to come in, okay, um, premium assistance is what individuals are going to be eligible for if they make more than 100% but less than 400%. 
Now, in, that's in an opt-out state. So in an opt-out state, if somebody makes 100% to 400% modified adjusted gross income, they will be eligible for the federal government to pay part of their premium for them. Now, they do have to be a tax filing unit. They have to use a marketplace. And again, they have to be lawfully present in the country. So the next question really is, can hospitals, like many hospitals today, your hospital may be one of those, pay the COBRA payments for individuals who lost their job and you pay COBRA so that they, in essence, stay insured, can hospitals pay um, this premium assistance or provide some assistance to patients if somebody says, well, I still can't afford it even if the federal government helps, I still can't afford insurance. So do we have results, Brad? We do. This one's uh, pretty evenly split. 55% uh, said yes, while 45% said no. Well, that's it. That's, I'm not surprised because this is a hot topic right now. And even um, I don't have it in my slide simply because um, it's, it, it has definitely been a hot topic. Um, Health and Human Services came out recently and said that since well, actually it was IRS that came out and said, since these insurance products are, are not, um, they're, they're on the, the marketplace, they are not suspect for any anti-kickback legislation. So hospitals, in essence, could, pre could pay the premiums, according to IRS and not be considered a potential kickback, which I think some hospitals were at least concerned about. So we've crossed that threshold. But then in the last few days, there's been some communication from CMS that CMS is, quote, concerned about hospitals paying these premiums. And the reason that CMS is concerned is because they believe it could skew the risk pool for the insurance company meaning that hospitals would probably pay for the sicker patients to enroll. And so CMS has um, at least lodged an opinion that it's not been a directive, but an opinion that perhaps insurance companies should deny payments from hospitals or healthcare organizations. Um, I think this topic is going to continue to be a little bit noisy. Uh, we anticipate it's going to be noisy for another month or so and will perhaps settle down um, and, and we'll get some better direction about what hospitals can and couldn't and can't do. Now, we've been able to get some verbal guidance from CMS that if a hospital pays the premium assistance, and I'm going to kind of move on to show you this, um, and, and then I'll come back. Uh, you won't miss anything. But let's say, for instance, an individual at 100% of the federal poverty level would only have to pay 2% of their income, um, which would be if a, a family of one, only $19 a month. However, the true premium for that insurance was probably around $350 or something. If a hospital pays the premium, what CMS has told us only verbally, we've not gotten it in writing, is that hospitals would have to pay the $350 a month. They would not be eligible to pay only the $19 per month. So that may be part of what your hospitals are wrestling with as well, that, um, you know, could, you know, if it's only going to cost the patient 19 why would the hospital then pay 350 So I do think this is a, um, it's an interesting discussion, more to come. I would say just stay tuned on it. That's exactly what we're doing. Um, so then moving on, the, the premium tax credit that a person gets depends on the household size. It depends on their income. And it depends, frankly, what um, metal level the patient chooses because that, that would correlate to the premium. And it also, the premium can be based on how old the person is. We all know that the premium is a little bit higher based on age and also based on their history of cigarette smoking. 
So I wanted to give you this so you could get an idea of um, what would it be like for an individual um, who is making 150% of the federal poverty level up to 400% of the federal poverty level, what percentage of their income would need to go to the insurance premium? And then this brings it home, I think, a little bit better so that you can see, all right, 100% uh, of federal poverty is about $11,000 a year. So you could see that person at 100%, if they had three members in their family, would only be $33. Now, 400% of federal poverty level for a single person is around 60,000. For a family, I think it goes up to 100,000. So you might say, okay, is $600 affordable, even if it's a family of three and you're making $100,000? You know, none of us probably, because we have employer-sponsored plans, are likely paying $600 a month premium. So the concern is, will people really pay and buy this insurance? There's some other concerns about, will individuals sign up, pay the first premium, and then when the bill comes for the next premium, find themselves in a spot where they're having to juggle food, um, medication, gas, and will they then um, forget to pay the premium or willfully choose not to, and therefore, are they going to then have some, um, you know, movement off the plan? So it might be a good time, Brad, um, to pull up another polling question. All right. Uh, which one would you like? We've got one about presumptive eligibility, hospital charity care, and Let's hospital pull up outreach. Charity care. All yeah. right. Okay, so then I'll talk for just a minute and explain this slide about there are two things that the federal government is helping with on the insurance plan. One is helping pay the premium, and the other is cost-sharing reduction. So if someone's under 250% of federal poverty level, the, the plan will also help pay some of their co-pays, or we might call co-insurance, or deductibles. But some of the plans are going to have the bronze plan, for instance, have a $5,000 deductible and a 40% co-insurance, which means the patient is going to pay 40% of the insurance. So hence, our, our polling question about charity care fits in here because one of the questions we've discussed with a number of our customers is, what is charity care? Is the new charity care going to be balanced after insurance? Because let's say you have a 30-year-old come in with an appendectomy. Right off the bat, they have a $5,000 deductible, and then they have to pay 40% of charges. Is that 30-year-old really going to be prepared, and are they, frankly, going to be able to afford to, because they're low-income people, pay their um, their full bill that they're supposed to because they have insurance. And so, Brad, um, if the poll is, um, if, if we've got most of the answers in, maybe we could see what people are thinking about charity care. It looks like people haven't really been thinking about uh, charity care too much. Well, great. That gives me the opportunity to say you might want to be thinking about your charity care uh, policy and process. Um, and the way, the reason I ask that is there, there are a couple of things, um, what I just mentioned about the individual that comes in, you know, uh, there is also a catastrophic plan that a person under 30 can buy that has a higher deductible than the 5,000 and has more responsibility on the patient. But is that going to how is that going to impact your charity care? Because the question, is it, is probably redundant. It is going to impact your charity care. Do you currently have a plan where your, um, your charity care covers balance after insurance already today? And how are you going to approach patients um, who pay the first month's premium, but then they 
forget or find they, they reprioritize their spending and they don't pay the second month's premium because another interesting component of this new insurance world is there is a 90-day grace period. So if patient pays month one, they don't pay month two, theoretically they're not really covered because they haven't paid their premium. But technically they're covered for the second, third, and fourth month because that is their grace period. So the second month, if they come to your facility, the insurance plan has to pick up the expense and pay your, um, your charges or your contracted rate. But the third and fourth month, okay, so we said the first month they paid, second, third, and fourth month they didn't, but the second, third, and fourth month are part of their 90-day grace period. So the third and fourth month, they, let's say they show up during that time period. Interesting, that the burden of that cost is on the hospital. So what's going to happen there and how are you going to treat those patients? Um, are you going to say, well, you could have, you should have had insurance, you were signed up, you just didn't pay your premium, therefore you're not eligible because our charity care policy is that it's payer of last resort. Or are you going to want to write it off to charity care as opposed to bad debt? And so I think now is a good time for you to be thinking about what impact this new world of insurance is going to have on your charity care. Okay? Um, might be a good time to ask that presumptive question, Brad. Okay. All right, so the question is, are you aware of the changes to presumptive eligibility for Medicaid? And so we've got people voting now. We'll give it just about another minute or so, so everybody get okay. your, your response in. So while people are responding, I'll talk about what presumptive eligibility is today. Most of us are somewhat familiar with presumptive eligibility for Medicaid in that we today perceive it as a pregnant woman goes to a health department. Number one, obviously they can um, confirm that she's pregnant and she verbally attests to her income and therefore is eligible for 30 days for Medicaid for outpatient prenatal services. The intention then is that that pregnant woman must complete a full Medicaid application in that 30 days to get ongoing Medicaid. Well, that very process that I just explained, CMS has written regulations as a part of the Affordable Care Act that that process will be extended to hospitals being able to presumptively declare someone eligible for Medicaid for all MAGI determined Medicaid categories. So in an opt-in state, that would essentially be all Medicaid um, patients. In an opt-out state, it's really going to be your mother babies and your children. Um, your disability is not going to be able to be determined presumptively. So, Brad, do we have answers about um, presumptive? We do. This one's split uh, pretty evenly with a few more folks uh, being unaware of that with 56 no's and 44 yeses. Okay. And there's also, um, you might want to talk with your hospitals because the American Hospital Association has also recently um, put out a survey to hospitals because one of the components of presumptive eligibility is that a hospital is not supposed to delegate the ability um, to perform charity care. And the American Hospital Association actually, we're working in conjunction with them because we believe this will be a significant um, barrier to hospitals being able to declare presumptive 
um, because most hospitals today do use a third party, i.e. someone like Chamberlain Edmonds or another vendor to help you with your Medicaid. And if you were to have to take on the burden of all the presumptive and then the following up on applications, that would put an undue burden and an undue expertise on your staff. And so um, what we're working with the American Hospital Association on is um, some information back from the survey and also from our experience um, to give CMS um, a really ask them to rephrase that part of the regulation and amend it. But basically what this means is come January 1, um, the, well, first of all, the states have to tell you what the process is. Um, secondly, you as a hospital have to say to the state Medicaid department, you want to be a qualified entity. So. If you're, you know, on the phone today, I would say please find out if, you know, do your hospitals want to do this? Um, some hospitals are saying, you know, if, if Medicaid is going to be fast for this group of people anyway, we're not even really sure we want to do presumptive because there, there are some um, extra steps in presumptive that are not there today. And um, those extra steps are that, yes, you can do the application, your state will decide. I can tell you um, in one state where we do presumptive for hospitals today, we fax in an application. In another state, we actually do the application on the web portal. And we do, the good news is, we get the Medicaid presumptive number very quickly, like within a week, and the hospital is able to bill for that episode of care. That's the good news. Um, the the little hook to this presumptive is that the state has the ability to come back and review with the hospital how well the hospital is doing on making sure the patient completes an application. And Brad, I just lost my screenshot, so I'm hoping I, folks are still there. Are we still good? Um, yeah, I can still see your PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. Great. Just wanted to check in. Um, so the way the process goes, and I think it's probably a little better if I show you really this slide, that the process that we've determined makes sense for our customers is that we would interview the patient if they're eligible for presumptive, do that, send that form in, but continue to complete the interview with the patient for a full Medicaid application. And the reason why is the hospital will actually be evaluated based on the percentage of your patients that you declare presumptively eligible complete this full Medicaid application. And if the hospital fails to meet whatever the state says the appropriate threshold is, the hospital could lose the ability to do presumptive. Now, a lot of debate on this topic as well. American Hospital Association came out, um, you know, with a um, with a best practice process here, which you can see in the slide. Some states are saying they don't really think presumptive is necessary. Um, for instance, the state Medicaid director in Arizona um, said they generally, for hospitalized patients, turn around a Medicaid approval within about a week anyway. And that actually is accurate. We do a good bit of work for hospitals in Arizona. And believe it or not, for patients that are inpatient anyway, we oftentimes will have the Medicaid decision or approval before they get discharged. So pick yourself up off the floor, because I don't think that's always the way it happens in other states. But um, I would say if you're not aware of presumptive, Fill yourselves in, watch the news, get, um, get a little more awareness, and then start discussing with your hospitals what you're going to do and realize that all states are required to provide presumptive eligibility to hospitals. Hospitals are not required to do it. So if a hospital says, we think it's just going to be easier to do it the way we're accustomed to doing it, that's perfectly acceptable. 
but um, we wanted to be prepared if our hospital customers did want to do presumptive. So walk through that part. So Brad, we have uh, one more question, polling question. I believe we do. Here we go. So is your hospital planning to do any outreach to current pa with current patients to proactively enroll them in a qualified health plan? So we'll, we'll leave that up for a minute or so. So give okay. everybody a chance to get the response in. Um, so. And I'll talk to you a little bit about, as you're answering that, what we've talked to hospitals about in terms of outreach would be if you have patients that are at a clinic today and you know they're going to continue to visit that clinic, they're uninsured, would you want to proactively enroll, help enroll those people in an insurance plan? If you have um, somebody as an inpatient, would you want to proactively enroll them while you have them in a bed, even knowing that getting them on insurance is not going to provide a remittance for that current episode of care. Um, also, most hospitals have sort of known frequent flyers through your emergency department. Would you want <clears throat> to, to reach out to any of those individuals and offer to assist them in getting covered with an insurance plan. So, how are we doing on the poll, Brad? All right, so we've got some results here. Uh, about two thirds of the of the folks said uh, yes that they are planning to do some outreach proactively. Okay, um, we've talked with our customers about doing outreach and and doing perhaps we've talked about several varieties. Um, one of our hospitals really wants. One of our employees just sitting close to the lobby, where in a secure area, however, where they could just have walk-ins or have people call and, and make appointments and have that guidance where there is a person they could come to and be on site. Some of our hospitals have said they'd like our staff to go with them to do health fairs and with our um, tablet technology, um, take the tablets and be able to enroll people at health fairs or you know, get the bulk of the enrollment going at the health fair and maybe do some follow-up work for that later. Um, some of our hospitals we've talked to about sharing um, patients we've either screened in the past that um, we were not able to take an application for because they were over income for Medicaid, proactively doing outreach to that group of patients. And um, some hospitals have said, we really know, um, based on our own claims data, what patients are you know, here frequently, they're sick, we see the um, you know, comorbidities that they have, and we'd like to really give you a file that we'd like you to make outbound calls to or send postcards or some combination of that. And so those are the kinds of things that we are working um, that we're in the process now of doing for our customers. So, okay, so what else is um, PEA doing? Well, we've had a dedicated team for um, the Affordable Care Act. We've met with um, at least, well, well over 100 of our key customers so far and given them executive briefings similar to what you've seen today and then spend some detailed time with them looking at, well, well, what impact does this have on your hospital and what would you like to talk about um, in more detail? We have worked with Cook County Hospital and, and, and Health Services in the south side of Chicago for about 10 years. And um, the Cook County Health and Hospital Systems got a waiver a year ago. And so they've actually um, been operating a patient-centered medical home it is a Medicaid medical home. It's a very narrow network with uh, Cook County facilities and some federally qualified health um, clinics. And so we've been helping enroll patients in that Medicaid waiver program for the past year. So we do have a pretty good idea of what it's going to do. Um, 
particularly what it's going to mean in a state like Kentucky that has decided to opt in, or how much the increase is going to be, frankly, for those of you in Tennessee, should Tennessee decide to opt in. Um, CEA is a certified designated organization, as I said, with CMS. And then we have um, additional agreements executed in about 10 other states in which we operate with the exchanges. There are 14 states that have additional legislation from the insurance commissioners about how and uh, what certified application counselors can do. And just want to make sure folks on this call know that both Georgia and Tennessee do have additional legislation. So if you're planning to have your staff be certified application counselors, my recommendation would be you just check with the insurance commissioner's office to make sure you're meeting those requirements as well. Um, Georgia's actually pretty stringent. Tennessee, I think, is still in the process of developing theirs. And then, as I said before, we're updating, expanding our software and delivery methods in terms of really just meeting the goals that we have stated below. So any other questions at this point? Hey, Gwen, we've got one that came in uh, earlier that I've okay. been kind of saving because it was kind of an overall question. Um, but Danny had asked, you know, what thoughts do you have regarding ACA's impact upon pediatric not-for-profit hospitals? Um, regarding the reimbursements by Medicaid and commercial payers? Hmm. That's an interesting question, Danny. Um, we don't, Chamberlain Emmons doesn't work with a lot of pediatric hospitals, so I would have to say you're asking me something that's a little bit out of our sweet spot and a little bit out of perhaps my own personal expertise. Um, I, I think uh, it's rare that I say I'd rather not answer a question, but, but Danny, I don't think I'm your subject matter expert on this one. I, I hope you'll understand that. I'm, um, it's not that I'm trying to dodge a question. It's just that I, I, I don't want to give you incorrect advice. And really all I can add to that from, from the Vanderbilt perspective, since I'm not really involved in the, the registration or the, the managed care contracting side of things, is I know traditionally we have been able to successfully register, you know, uninsured children um, into 10 care um, that have come into our children's hospital here. And I know I've not heard any talk about any of that changing or, or really impacting our children's hospital. No, I've not seen um, really as, a, as the Affordable Care Act, most of the changes are outside the scope of impacting children. I don't believe the CHIP program is changing. I did have somebody bring a question to me that I researched a good bit. What was, uh, the question was, would CHIP eventually be enrolling through the web portal and through, you know, would, would states try to move um, CHIP children to an insurance plan. And I, I think there's certainly some speculation about that. I've, I've certainly, as I, I researched to try to find an answer for that specific question, found some evidence to support that, that that could be in the plans, but I don't think it's in the immediate future by, by any stretch. OK, and, and I'll go ahead and ask right now, you know, if there's anyone else who's got questions, um, for Gwen, please submit those through the questions box um, that you see on your screen there um, so that we can we can answer those before we wrap up here. Well, I would like to thank um, the Tennessee HFMA. I mean, clearly this is a great vehicle for us to get information out to um, health care providers, and, and I just appreciate the opportunity. So, Buffy, thank you for asking us to present. I truly hope the presentation has been helpful to the group, um, and um, hope it's, you know, I always think it's nice if you can learn something different than when you uh, began the presentation. Um, if you've learned uh, at least one additional point, I think the time is worthwhile. So, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, really appreciate this. I've, I've spent a lot of time in the past working on our um, uninsured and, and 
private pay uh, policies and workflows. And so since even though I'm not in that realm anymore, it definitely peaks back some questions to how we had, had set things up that I hope the folks over there these days, um, I know they've been addressing uh, for us and makes me kind of glad I'm over on the, the clinical operations side. don't have to think about it as much right now. Um, well, I, I understand. I love learning new things, and I will tell you, I've been, um, I've really, uh, thanks to our company, I've had the uh, luxury of focusing on the Affordable Care Act since about March, and um, it's definitely been an opportunity to stretch and, and learn new things. So it is the most significant change in healthcare our country has seen since um, the implementation of Medicare. So it's going to be interesting um, road here in the next six months, year, or whatever it takes to get it all implemented. So, um, well, that's this, this is great. We don't have any other uh, any other questions um, per pertaining okay. to this. I do have a question um, that came through about uh, CPE credit and certificate. So I'll just go ahead and address that to the group. Um, right now, we cannot issue CPE certificates um, for CPAs like myself um, for for those credits. But if you've got other certifications that HFMA. Um, Programs will typically provide you with your required uh, CPE. Um, we can definitely um, take care of that um, and help you out with that. Um, if you will just email those requests to uh, cpe at tnhfma.org. Um, our CPE coordinator will get those um, can get those taken care of for you. We're hoping to be able to offer CPE for CPAs for our webinars um, in the near future. Um, and then so kind of the other kind of administrative follow-up I've got is so once we end the webinar later this afternoon you will get uh, a follow-up email um, and in that it's got a link um, just to our, our general survey about the webinar and the presentations um, that's done out through SurveyMonkey so if you get that I appreciate you clicking through um, it's very short shouldn't take you more than three or four minutes uh, to complete and everybody to complete that um, um, yes. Will there also be a way for someone to get the PowerPoint um, if they wanted it? Yes, Buffy. Um, yep, the PowerPoint is up on the website right now. Um, and so that website is tnhfma.org slash webinars. Um, and we've also been recording this session as well. And so I will usually get this posted up onto YouTube within a day or two um, and update our website uh, to include a link to that or you can just go to youtube.com or yeah youtube.com slash tnhfma to access our YouTube channel um, and access this and any other webinars we've done in the past. So if if no one's got anything else, um, that's that's it for us. So thank you very much, and we hope to see you uh, in a month for our next Tennessee Trains on Tuesdays.